Every year, more or less on schedule, the rain clouds build up, the lightning flashes, and the life-giving rain comes to southwest Africa. Every living thing depends on the rains breaking. Nineteen eighty three was the year when the rains failed. It was the worst drought southern Africa has known in more than a hundred years. One of the worst hit areas was southwest Africa, nowadays known as Namibia. It is dry at the best of times. Namibia contains one of the largest national parks in the world, Itosha, home of huge herds of zebra and springbok. Itosha is also famous for its lions. There are at least 200 of them in a park half the size of Switzerland. When the rains come on time, the grass grows and the prey animals become fat and plentiful. The lions are sleek and plentiful also. In times of shortage and drought, sympathy usually focuses on the prey animals who die for lack of water and grazing. But what happens to the lions? That's a story that doesn't often get told. As the major predators, the lions of Itosha are at the end of the food chain. They depend on the rains making the grass grow so that the springbok and zebra can eat the grass so that the lions can eat them. If you wish to learn how desperate are the effects of a freak drought, you have only to follow the fortunes of a pride of lions. The facts stick out like this poor lioness's ribs. Better than anything, she tells the story of the drought of the century. The worst drought in Southern Africa's recorded history, unbelievably enough, was the work of a warm water current in the Central Pacific called El Nino. Every few years, El Nino runs amok. In 1982, it went badly off the rails causing weather disturbances that brought floods from Ecuador to California, cyclones in Polynesia, bushfires in Australia, and drought in South Africa and Namibia. El Nino upset the whole weather system of the Southern Hemisphere. The animals of Itosha became, globally speaking, a relatively minor casualty, but a casualty just the same. When the drought first made itself felt, the plains animals of Itosha coped with it as they had always done. The zebra are expert at making use of sun-dried vegetation. In such conditions, kudu both browse and graze on whatever they can find. Eland, the largest of all the antelope, usually browse from trees. In times of drought, they'll look for food at ground level. Springbok are mainly grazers. They can find grass on ground that looks totally bare. They can exist for a long time in near desert situations. As for the warthogs, they solve the problem by grubbing for roots and tubers below ground level. Giraffe are better off than most, at least in the early part of a drought. Many of the trees on which they feed are deep-rooted and find water far below ground. This still bears a few leaves on which the giraffe can feed. So in the first stages of the great drought, the browsers and grazers of the plains still manage to find enough food to support themselves. At first, the lions even benefited from the situation. The zebra, springbok, and the rest still had to drink. The water holes were shrinking daily under El Nino's distant but destructive influence. So the prey animals tended to concentrate to get the water while it lasted. Such concentrations provided a perfect opportunity for ambush. In the shadow of the trees, our pride of lions waits.
After nine rainless months, there is still plenty of easily available food about. If there is a hint of thinness about some of the females, it is clear that hard times have not come to the pride yet. The smaller the waterhole, the easier the ambush. Or so you might think. This drinking place has shrunk until it's only a few yards wide. It's much used by kudu, extremely cautious antelope. With food increasingly at a premium, the lions can afford few mistakes, and yet they still make them. An action replay shows how even a hungry lioness can fall down on the job. As the unrelieved months of drought pass, the grassy plains turn to dust and the prey animals move away to seek food elsewhere, often leaving a pride of lions with little food in their own territory. Zebra and springbok, hartebeest and giraffe don't have set territories or even home ranges. They move where the browsing and grazing is greenest, or in time of drought, where they can at least find something to eat. The rhino and the elephant are likewise free to come and go. But the plight of a pride of lions, once the plains have been deserted by the prey animals, is desperate indeed. The pride is tied to its territory. If it tries to follow the game, it may find itself in conflict with resident prides in the area to which the herds have moved. And so the pride remains, hoping for its hunting luck to change, and with no way of knowing that this is the drought of the century. Unless the pride makes a substantial kill very shortly, this lioness may soon die. The young males are in slightly better condition, but, as will be seen, they get the lion's share of whatever food is going. Unexpectedly, some zebra show up, but even the lion closest to them hasn't the stamina to give chase. Most at risk are the half-grown cubs. If they can't provide their young with regular food, the lionesses in this pride can at least lead them to water. They're lucky to have some small soak holes fed by underground springs in their territory. The herds have moved away from the plains, and though the drought is biting hard with them, antelope like the roan and the red hartebeest still look in comparatively good condition. Extreme shortage of water has crowded many different species around the same dusty waterhole. Those are hemsbok, dry country antelope that normally get their moisture from the vegetation they eat. 
A springbok, usually a grazer, is thankful to find a leaf on which to browse. Zebra, these are mountain zebra, somehow always manage to look sleek even when all around are starving. You'd think they'd want to drink what little water there is rather than roll in it, muddying it for themselves and their companions. But it's a way of keeping cool and easing the irritations of parasites. Wallowing is something the plain zebra never do. They much prefer a dust bath. In such horrific drought conditions, the trees in the background look surprisingly green. They're Mapani trees, whose exceptionally deep roots always somehow reach water. Unfortunately, most animals find Mapani leaves unpleasant to eat, so they do little to solve the food problem. Back on the empty plains, the pride still makes its daily trek to the soak holes for water. The youngest cubs are very close to death now. A kill must take place soon if they're to survive many days more. Suddenly, there's a chance. A male spots a lone springbok, perhaps itself weakened and unwary from lack of food. It certainly lacks its usual turn of speed. The plains jackals are starving too. Normally, they'd never dare to move in so quickly on a kill. Now you see why the males are in better shape than the lionesses or cubs. The male in possession fights a lioness off. He wants it all for himself. He's so busy attacking her that he loses his prize to the second male. A third male arrives. Females and cubs never get a look in. Her emaciated flanks show how little gallantry there is among a starving pride of lions. The lioness has to be content with a single leg, and there's little enough nourishment on that. In normal conditions, a jackal would never take such a liberty with a feeding lion. Perhaps it hopes to distract the lion long enough to steal some scraps for itself. Instead, the poor starving lioness is reduced to playing the role of jackal, looking for scraps from her lord and master's table. In the end, the pied crow does almost as well as the lioness. She makes a half-hearted attempt to scavenge off the scavengers. Finally, her strength gives out. Too weak to kill for herself, let alone fight for her share of a kill. She won't last much longer now. 
Only the males have some chance of surviving the drought to pass on their genes to another generation. The regular water holes have long ago dried up. In a normal year, the water at this drinking place would nearly fill the screen. The dark area is all that remains, and that's mostly stinking black mud. A little spring water sometimes seeps through among the stones around the edge. The keen noses of the kudu can detect its presence. A plain zebra knows the water is just below the rocks and paws with its hooves in an attempt to reach it. The soak holes, where the lions get their daily drink, are bitter and brackish, and even they have shrunk in size. They're used by many species, from kudu to rhino. The lions still drink here regularly, and though it's a good place for an ambush, the prey animals are so plagued by thirst that they appear to ignore the danger. Perhaps they even sense that the lions have lost their hunting strength. The warthog's ribs stick out starkly, but compared to the predators who'd like to eat him, he's a picture of health. He's in the middle of the food chain, as is the baboon. As predators, the lions, alas, are on the end, the thin end. Now, as the drought moves into its second year, only the deep-rooted mapani trees can find any moisture. Their distasteful green leaves offer a promise they can't fulfill. Only a really desperate animal will browse on them. The elephants of Itosha are certainly desperate, and few are more distressed than the matriarch who leads this small cow herd. Her calf has died of malnutrition and thirst, and the mother just refuses to believe it. For hours, she stood over the dead calf, trying to raise it from the dead. Gradually, the other members of her herd move away until she's left with an older calf and the dead infant. She'll stay perhaps until nightfall, and then thirst will force her too to move on. The western part of Itosha is dry even when the rains come on time. There, the park authorities have provided wind pumps to raise deep-lying water to fill drinking tanks and troughs. Only a limited number of animals can use these, of course. The elephants are often first in the queue. The babies in this herd are luckier than most. But there are dangers for very small infants at these man-made drinking places. The loving care elephant mothers show their children is wonderful to behold. This time the baby is saved. It's tottering on its feet, though probably not from its recent escape from drowning. It's only a few days old. 
it seeks comfort and a feed from its mother. She reassures it by touching the baby with her trunk. The elephant herd found the water trough in time. Other animals were not so lucky. There's always one beneficiary of a wildlife disaster. For vultures, drought is no exception. Even the worst drought in a century has to end sometime. But when it does, there'll be very few, if any, of the pride we saw in its prime at the start of this program, left to celebrate the coming of the rains. A few of the big males may make it, but probably none of the lionesses, let alone their half-grown cubs. The drought that hit the whole of the Southern Hemisphere in 1982, causing untold suffering to human as well as to wildlife, broke in Itosha in 1984. Africa never does things by halves. A few days after the first rains, plains that were a desert become a flower garden. The grazing animals are suddenly surrounded by plenty. They'll start to breed at once and then numbers will begin to build up again. There'll be other lions to hunt them, but not the pride that took the full withering force of the drought of the century. <laughs> 